Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're going to be investigators. We're going to be making our way to the scene of the crime. We're going to be getting some evidence. We're going to be giving it to our forensic scientist. They're going to be working on trying to figure out who actually did this. Because there was a murder, and it was in Hong Kong. And there's a lot of deception, because one of us is going to be a murderer. So here we're talking about deception, murder in Hong Kong. This is sort of a reprinting of a game called CS Files that came out, uh, I believe, in Japan a couple years ago. And now it's come out uh, with a new printing uh, via Kickstarter for Gray Fox Games with a much better uh, sort of artwork and components. It's for 4 to 12 players. It's sort of a social deduction-ish game. Let's take a look. I'll show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. In this game, it's a hidden role deduction game, okay? And what's going to happen is one player is going to secretly be known as the murderer. And in this case, we're playing with a four-player game, which is the minimum player count. And these three guys are all on the same team trying to catch, figure out who the murderer is and catch him. And here you have the two investigators and then a forensic scientist. So in general, these guys are trying to figure out who the murderer is and figure out what they used and see some, some evidence there as well. Now, at the beginning of the game, every player is going to get four cards that are basically clues, and these are sort of brownish-red cards, and four cards of how the murder happened. So some clues and how it happened. Everyone's going to get four of each of those. Usually they'd be more spread out in front of that person, but to get them on the camera, there's the four different ones. And just to show you the good artwork on these cards here, uh, you can see it's really well done artistically, and just some cool-looking things there. And then what happens is all these cards get turned over and shuffled up, and secretly given to each player. And then at one point, after it's shuffled, one player is going to be the forensic scientist. So we ask whoever the forensic scientist is to face up their card, and essentially they're not going to have any clues this game. So these all get taken away, and then we give them a board to set up. But before that happens, everyone closes their eyes. The forensic scientist says, everyone close your eyes. And then they say, only the murderer open your eyes. Now this player is the murderer. He would leave his card secret, of course, but the murderer would open his eyes. He says, murderer, point to one clue and how the murder was done. So he's going to point at one of these cards and one of these cards simultaneously. So the forensic scientist, even though he's on the good team, knows what who the murderer is and, what, and how it was done. So this player, everyone else's eyes are closed except the forensic scientist and the murderer. And the murderer might say, he might just go like this. And quietly, silently, the forensic scientist knows it's candy and scarf. At that point, the forensic scientist says everyone can open their eyes, and the game begins. Now, the forensic scientist is going to build this board here, and he's going to get a bunch of bullets, which is going to be clues that he's trying to give to other players. And every player is also going to get a badge, which essentially is going to allow them to make one guess throughout the game. Now, how the game works is it's three rounds long. The first phase is the evidence collection phase, and then we move on to the presentation phase for all three rounds. Let's look at the evidence collection phase. Now remember, the forensic scientist knows who it is and knows what the crime is, but he can't say anything. In fact, in this game, the forensic scientist cannot say one word, give any hints, gestures, facial expressions. They have to be silent and, no, and really do nothing. Uh, but what happens is they get a board of six uh, tiles here. The cause of death always is in every game. The location of the crime, there's four different ones that get shuffled, and these are different every game. Uh, there's also four other ones that come out that are basically evidence and things like that. And there's a ton of these tiles in the game, and these are randomized and different every game as well. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at some of these things, and one at a time they're going to take one of these bullets, and they're going to place it on one of these uh, tiles, and they're going to place them on one specific clue. Uh, so let's see this. Let's see. Let's back up here and look at all these, and then let's decide what this player might do. Now one at a time he can't pick any one of these, but maybe he picks cause of death, and he says suffocation. And then he can take another one and put it on another tile. Now, you can never, never have more than one of these on each on one tile. There'll be one bullet on each tile at the end of this first round. But they can wait as long as they want and let other people start talking about suffocation. Now, everyone's trying to find the murderer, and everyone's supposedly good, right? So no one's going to point to themselves. So maybe on this player, the other two players are pointing to this guy and say, huh, a whip. You could wrap a whip around somebody and, and, and suffocate them. Maybe, maybe it's this. 
or maybe a soft drink, um, you know, they, they poured it down their throat and they didn't let them swallow and that made them suffocate. And all different things, and same with a liquid drug. Maybe that liquid drug closed in on their, their windpipes and they were unable to breathe and that was suffocation. And the other two players look at this person and go, well, maybe you could suffocate someone by wrapping a scarf around their neck and pine it tight. Maybe in a surgery room, somebody came over and put a pillow on somebody's face while they were waiting to, to do it. Maybe there's an injection that, again, caused their, 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 their windpipe to close or to st stop them from breathing. And then the other two players will look at this and go, huh, maybe they put a dumbbell on the person's neck and didn't let them breathe. Maybe they wrapped a metal chain around them. Maybe they put an apple in their mouth like a gag and they couldn't breathe that way. It could be any of these. And then the next player, so once, once now this player is listening to what's going on and they're going to be, you know, adjusting. So maybe they said, well, you know what, maybe if it was more like this, I'd think this. And this player is listening to those clues and adapting and, and you can never move something once it's there. And maybe they go over here and they, they select perverted, right? And then people start to talk and they, they're trying to figure it out what it is. And over the course of this first round, they will eventually have placed one on each one of these. So after the first round here, the first phase of the first round, there'll be one on each and everyone has now finished kind of talking, and then we move on to the presentation phase. Now, each player going clockwise has 30 seconds to say what they think it is without anybody interrupting. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Now, in a small game like this, you probably don't even need this phase because everyone gets to hear each other, but in a larger game with 10 or 12 people, you'll need this because everyone can't hear everybody yapping at the same time. So the beginning of the second round, what happens is the forensic scientist draws a new tile. There's a ton of these things. They will take any one of the four ones that have the orange and they will take it out. So let's say they take this piece of evidence out, it gets discarded, and then a new one comes in and then they pretty much put it here. Okay, so he says cold. Of course, that must be about the scarf, right? So again, you get a new thing of evidence. Everyone's talking. That's the only new piece of evidence that's added. So everyone's talking, and then you get that second phase of the presentation. And then there'll be a third round where they take another one. So maybe they take this one out, and then they bring in a third one. So they bring in a random third one, and they decided to do something again. So maybe it's, uh, I don't know, prolonged sound or sudden sound of someone getting choked and then they can't hear them anymore. And again, the same thing happens. Everyone's talking and then we do a presentation round. Now, at any time in the game, everybody has one of these badges. They can just say, stop, I'm interrupting the game. I'm using my one guess and I'm going to guess what it is. So they would look at any one player's board and pick one of the orange cards and one of the blue cards. And basically the forensic scientist is either going to say yes and you've won with the forensic scientist, or they will just say no. Even if they get one of them right, they just say no. And that player's still in, they just basically cannot guess again. This will continue until either the three rounds ends and all the players have pretty much gone to the end uh, through, the, through the, the, three, the two phases of each three rounds, or until the, th the last player has, uh, has basically you know, done their guess. Obviously the game stops immediately if someone has won, and that whole entire team wins, all the investigators and all the, and the forensic scientists, or if all the, uh, the, the guessers are gone, it hasn't happened, like if all, all three people guessed and it wasn't found out, the murderer would then immediately win, flip over his card and tell everybody, oh, it was the candy and the scarf. Now the murderer can guess too, just to kind of throw people off. He might be trying to guess what other people might think, obviously trying to place doubt on somebody else. That's pretty much how the game is played. So either the forensic scientists and the investigators are winning as a team or the murderer is winning by himself. Now if you're playing with six or more players, there's a new role you can add called the accomplice. The accomplice is red, it's, he's basically on the murderer's team. Now the accomplice gets to open his eyes with the murderer and he gets to see who the murderer is and what the crime is. So these guys have perfect information. Forensic scientist knows who these two people are and so they, they're working together. If the murderer wins, the accomplice wins, wins as well. Now, if you're playing with this, you can also play with the witness who's on the good team. Now, after these two do their thing at the beginning of the game, they close their eyes. The forensic scientist has the witness open their eyes. The forensic scientist quietly just points at the two people. So the witness will know which two are the murderer and the accomplice. He won't know which one's which, and he won't know the exact solve of the crime. They won't know exactly what it is, but he'll know which two people are on the bad team. Now, with that information, he can try to guide this team a little easier to try to get the solution but he can't do it too easy because if at the end of the game, this team has won, these two guys get to flip over their cards and try to discuss who they think the witness is. So even if they've lost, if they have one chance, if they choose the witness, the witness was killed and these guys get away and win at the last moment. 
Now you can see these tiles here, there are a ton of them that come with this game. And it's always it's gonna depend on also the combination of which ones come out and the combinations of the cards. So it really has a lot of replayability value. There's also some special event tiles that come out that do some certain things. And these are a variant, you don't have to play with them, but essentially after the first round, once one of these cards is discarded, this one might come up that says a useful clue. The forensic scientist draws five scene tiles that's these tiles here, uh, and choose one to replace any existing tile in the display. This one is, each player must flip over any one of their cards and rule it out, and of course the murderer can't flip over the, the, the case. So different things that can happen, and that's pretty much the game. It takes 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the number of players, usually closer to 15, but I guess if you have a large group it could possibly go to 30, and that's how you play Deception, Murder in the Hong Kong. All right, well, I was interested in this game because I love deduction games. I love sort of hidden role, uh, social deduction games as well. And this sort of fit that niche. Wow, what can I say about this game? This game is absolutely amazing. It kind of blends two games that I really love. One is The Resistance Avalon uh, and Mysterium. Now, this originally came out as CS Files, I think, in Japan. It said 2014 they came out. And the original version of Mysterium in, in Poland and in Ukraine came out, it also said 2014. So they came out around the same time. So who knows if one borrowed one mechanic from the other, but it's weird because they're both sort of that very similar mechanic where the forensic scientist is almost the same as the ghost in Mysterium, but it's hard to see which one actually originally came out first. Also, you know, uh, Resistance Avalon came out 2012. So if you took the Merlin and Assassin role from Resistance Avalon, if you're familiar with that, and mixed it with the ghost of Mysterium, it makes this game, and I love both those other games, which is probably why I love this game. Let me tell you what's so awesome about this game. First of all, it's like, okay, anytime you're closing your eyes and someone's being some, the bad person, someone's being the good person, and somebody knows, it's a cool feeling, right? At the table, pointing fingers, calling each other liars, and trying to figure out the crime. The other cool thing is, okay, you've got all this crime stuff in front of you, and you're really trying to work together to try to figure out what's going on. And when that, when that forensic scientist gives you those clues and you're looking around, you're trying to talk through things. Well, it could be this, it could be this. And you saw me doing some of that on, uh, you know, with just one clue that looked pretty solid, how easily I'm able to twist that into other things. And that brings me to this other point, which is a lot of people would like to play those social deduction games, but they, they might steer away from them because they feel like I'm not a good liar. I don't want to have to lie. And I think this game is perfect for someone who feels that way because you don't have to lie at all. You could be the murderer and always what people are doing and they're always trying to point out obvious or maybe not so obvious connections between somebody else's cards and the clues that are given from the forensic scientist. So you're not lying when because everyone is saying, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. You're simply doing the same thing and you're not necessarily lying, you're just drawing your own conclusions. And so I think people that are afraid or don't like to lie, don't think they can lie well, they can play this game and get all the, the sort of the energy and the feeling of playing a social deduction game without having to lie. Gosh, it's amazing how, first of all, all the cards, there's almost 300 total cards between those evidence cards and the means cards. And then there's a ton of those tiles, right? And then the replayability in this game is amazing because you've got all those cards, you're almost never gonna see duplicates. And even if you do, they're gonna be with different people, different combinations. And then you've got those tiles, which, you know, there's a handful of those, and then even those are gonna be, when they combine with different things, they're gonna be different. So I think this game has like unlimited replayability. I love that it's fast. Uh, I love the, like, even the, the smaller play accounts work with this game. In fact, most social deduction games do not play well on the lower side of it. Resistance starts at five, it's okay at five, it's not great. Ultimate World starts at three, I think, and we usually need at least four, probably five for that. And it's like, you need those higher player counts. With this, we played four games with four players. Each of us was a forensic scientist once. And the murderer won twice, and the forensic scientist and the investigators won twice. And it seemed pretty balanced. I also like that if you find it being unbalanced in those smaller, uh, once you get better, maybe over time, it might be too easy with four players. Well, you can, there's variants in there to add cards or subtract cards as to how many of those clue cards are out there to make it a little easier or harder. So you can ratchet up or down the difficulty, got huge player ranges, it plays really fast, it, and it's an amazing experience. And it feels so different. Playing the murderer feels different. Playing the forensic scientist feels completely different. Playing the investigator feels different. Then you add in those extra roles, oh, it just blows your mind with, with you know, the accomplice who knows who the murderer is and what it is. Then the witness who knows who the two guys are but they don't know what the solve is. And they're trying to get their investigators to point and get the right thing but not be too obvious because they'll lose in the end if they get, they, they get outed. 
awesome, amazing game. This is, this is a game that should be in everyone's collection, in my opinion. That's Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. So I'm going to try something new here. Anytime I have a game, and I'm going to keep it in my collection, which doesn't happen very often anymore, you may not know that I'm also a saxophone player, music producer, uh, and, and do a lot of things around music. So I thought in a creative, a personal way, I'd like to do, give a sort of an exclamation point when I am going to keep a game. And we're just going to call it the Game Boy Geeks Jam. And I'll do this on my saxophone anytime I keep a game. Here's one for this one. <laughs> Thank you. 